It is wonderful, a wonderful thing when um, hymns and uh, songs of praise, uh, whether they're the old ones from our childhood or actually from our parents' childhood that we grew up hearing, or they are the new ones that are on the radio that are taking the Word of God and, and uh, putting into the context of the struggles that we live with. Where, where God speaks to us the biblical principles through songs. And uh, uh, there were a lot of songs that we sang when we were in the Pinellas Park Church that were Christian, contemporary Christian music, songs that we would hear on the radio. Uh, and we sang them as part of our worship uh, with a praise team. And uh, and after singing them for several years uh, that we were there, um, it wasn't until I had learned in January that we were going to be moving, and in March learned where we, where we were going to be moving, and it wasn't going to be until May that we were allowed to tell the church that we were moving. So there were very few people that were on that staff parish relations committee that knew and uh, there were a couple of songs that every time we sang them, I was choked up. Yeah. And I could barely get through singing it. I was trying not to be obvious. Uh, and uh, the words were meaning something uh, very specific to me that... Uh, at that time. I'm going to read this uh, middle verse uh, of what a friend we have in Jesus because it reminded me of a friend that I have here that uh, I spend time with kind of on a regular basis that is a believer, sort of. He's a believer that doesn't really 
recognize that God has offered us a very personal relationship. Um, and there are times that he's really up because uh, he, he, he has read the scriptures and uh, he has studied. He has studied several, re, uh, several religions and came upon, well, I'm going to follow the Christian religion because the one thing they have that none of the other religion has is Jesus. So there's a focus on Jesus. That's, that's important, and that's probably all he has to have to end up in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but just to go, go through life here on earth without that personal relationship with God means a whole lot of suffering that we don't need to suffer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of trouble right now. We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. That's the personal relationship. And that personal relationship that we start off with by speaking to Him, whether we know Him as Almighty God or Heavenly Father, O oh Lord and Savior Jesus, or Jesus, my friend, my brother, you know, or Holy Spirit, help me. Whatever way that we are coming to him in the first place, uh, we, we come. But we may be missing part of what he has for us. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What a relationship. What an invitation for us. And that's what we need to emphasize. I don't think... I don't think that people need a John the Baptist as much as they need a Jesus. Jesus did criticize the Pharisees and Sadducees a bit uh, because they should have known better and they needed some tough love. But most of the people knew they were sinners already. And most of the people that we interact with, they know deep down in their heart that there's something not right in their life. They may not accept that there's a such thing as sin, but they know there's something not right in their life. And Jesus is the one who will convict their heart. Our Heavenly Father, through the Holy Spirit, will convict their heart. They need to hear from us Whatever your struggle is, whatever your brokenness is, whatever your dissatisfaction is, God is offering relationship with you to put all those things in place. See, first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will fall in line. They need to hear that in a loving expression. They need to be told that they are accepted by this God that the, the media and the servants of Satan, whether they know it or, or, or not, want to tell us God is an angry God who wants to whip you down any chance he gets. And unfortunately, there's people within the church that are ready to tell, you know, they really want to emphasize that. But I don't believe that that's what the world needs. The world needs having trials and temptations. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. So, the sermon today, I, uh, I knew the title before I know what, knew what scripture it was going to be. Uh, how will I know? How will I know? It's because of several experiences that we had while we were in England and Wales. We didn't get to Scotland or Ireland, okay? Uh, because everywhere we went, we didn't want to just hurry away. Valerie joked about uh, what's the family vacation, summer vacation? Griswold. Yeah. Said that movie, Griswold Family Vacation. Uh, actually, some of the scenes in that movie were a lot like our vacations when I was growing up. My dad wanted to hurry to that place and that place and that, get as much in as we could. And I, I was kind of trying to do that when I said, let's spend a little bit of time in every country of the four. 
But God reminded me that the reason for us to go to England was because that's where Valerie wanted to go. That was her dream, to one day go to the place, places that she read about. English literature major. Let's go where uh, Shakespeare was born. And what's the lady's name that wrote Peter Rabbit? Beatrice Potter. Beatrice Potter. You know, when I asked that question previously, there were about eight or ten people that could remember her name. I read the story, Peter Rabbit, but I didn't pay attention to who wrote it. But we went to places, and that was the objective. So we spent our first week in the Cotswolds and, uh, at a wonderful manner. And I don't remember, oh, she remembers. When, when was that built? Um, 1500s. In 1500s, okay, and uh, it was it was like a big resort hotel, but it was built in the 1500s with stair stair with, uh, stairs that went this way and that way and the other, and passages that crisscross. And here's a big room over here, and here's something else. Um, I had on a couple of several different days. I took a little bit of time to go wander around. Where does this hall lead? What's through this door? Oh, wow, that's where I am now, you know. Um, thinking about, well, this is kind of like secret passages. And as I was going from one place to another, um, there was, a, a, this, a, on the second time, I think, that I was exploring, there was a British man that was coming down the hall the other direction, and he saw me looking this way and that way, and he said, uh, oh, have you seen the priest hole. And in his accent, I wasn't sure what he said. Priest hole. And then once I clarified, I still didn't know what he was talking about. What is a priest hole? I said, I, I, said, I don't know if I've seen it. What is a priest hole? He said, come with me. Come with me. And so we went uh, down these stairs, through that passage, and up these stairs, and over this way, and over that way. And there was a I had gone past this place, and in, you know, just on a blank wall, there was a cabinet door that was uh, about from here uh, to here, and you can open the cabinet door, and he showed me there was this uh, dark, hard wooden shelves in there. And it looked like something that some small books would be placed in. Or maybe it was a spice rack, you know, or a place for supplies that would go to, go to uh, the several different rooms that were dining rooms. I don't know what it was for, but here's these shelves. And he went, no, no, no. you could hear it was solid, uh, hard wood, thick wood. And, uh, and then he said, and then he reached down, and in a dark corner, he lifted a latch, and he pushed, I was trying to remember which direction, I'm pretty sure it pushed up, and it was opening. And he said, look inside. So I look in, and there's a space wide enough and long enough for a man to lie down and sleep. And then another, then a raised place that I picture, well, that could be where he sits on a little stool and he has his Bible and a candle. This was the priest hole. And he said the priest hole is where the, uh, the Lord of the manor would hide the priest when King Henry's Soldiers were coming to find and arrest any Catholic priests and any people that had uh, that, that were harboring the priests, anyone who had any Catholic paraphernalia at all, all of those things had to be hidden. So there would be a lookout that would see and then hurry to give warning and the priests would gather up the things and hide it and go and hide in a priest hole. There were, I think he said, seven other manors in the area, and I'm probably using the wrong word for it, but these big um, places where the Lord and their servants and stuff live, and then all of the people in the community around um, had protection from there. Um, but there were seven different places right there in the Cotswolds that you could find priest holes uh, in within walls, some of them several. Um, so anyway, uh, I wanted to share that with you in that 
uh, in, in, as he showed me that, we then had some conversation. He told me that, you see, King Henry was part of the time Catholic and part of the time pre a Protestant, and he would shift back and forth depending on whether, uh, uh, who he wanted to marry. And, uh, and so when he was in a particularly bad mood against the priests because he was told that he couldn't divorce a wife to marry another wife, then he turned Protestant and chopped off her head instead, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it was intriguing, but then the conversation went to um, Christian conversation and the spiritual problems in so much of the church. And I didn't get specific about our struggle with our denomination, uh, but we, we were talking about the church in general, and it was intriguing to me to uh, have him share a bit about the struggles that they had with the Church of England and the struggles with the Protestant Church. And, and so it was a, it was a nice um, spirit, spiritual education time, and it reinforced for me that there still are Christians there in England that are faithful to the faith, um, and, I, I, and I've had several different experiences. I want to get a little bit into Mark, and then I'll share a couple of more illustrations. And I, I did realize that we'll have several different Sundays with different illustrations. Um, with Moses, God gave Moses a burning bush that didn't burn. And then he also gave him, uh, sent his, his birth brother, you know, when Moses was told, I want you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, and Moses started coming up with his legitimate excuses. And as Moses pointed out his excuses, God pointed out, I'll be with you. That was the last line on this. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring Israel, the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And then he started giving indications of what it meant that he was going to be with him. Oh, but, but I don't speak well. I'm slow of speech. Some, sometimes that's translated, I stutter. Uh, uh, I think maybe it's more appropriately, I can't come up with the right words. I'm not really good with that. That's why I'm not in line to be Pharaoh. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but anyway, and, and God said, your brother is already on his way. I'm sending him from Egypt to you. I'll talk to you, you'll talk to your brother, and your brother will talk to the people. Because he was still part of the people. God had it all worked out. So how did Moses know? Well, he had a burning bush. God uh, said, I'll be with you, and I've already sent your brother. It's all taken care of. Here's a staff. Do some, do some things. But he had a lot of preparation to know that, okay, this is what God wants me to do. But we don't always get that, do we? Any of y'all ever see a burning bush that didn't burn up? No. No. How well I know. So let's look a little bit in Mark. I told you that I didn't know where the scripture was going to come from, but from the experiences that, that we had while we were in, uh, in England and Wales, um, I knew that the direction that God was going to want me to go with the sermon whether it was this first one or another. Apparently, I think it's going to be a, maybe a series. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus left where he went. Uh, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Any of y'all remember going to a uh, high school reunion? Remember my 10-year high school reunion? Um, I, would use, I practiced my Dale Carnegie uh, lessons, and I, uh, I asked so many questions from everybody that I was renewing you know, the hellos with. I would ask them questions and keep feeding them questions about them and what they were doing. Because I didn't want it to be known right away that I was now a pastor. And, uh, and in fact, I got through the whole day without anybody saying, so Frank, what are you doing these days? As I went from visit to visit. 
So the next day, several people came and said, Frank, we had a great conversation yesterday. This is what Dale Carnegie says. If you get people to talk about themselves, mm -hmm. when they finish the conversation and go away, they'll go away saying, man, that Frank Reynolds is such an interesting conversationalist. Because we talked all about that. Okay. I'm getting closer and closer. So, um, I managed to not have to tell anybody what I was doing, and then on the sec next day, people would come and say, so what are you doing? And I'd tell them, and I'd see that look on their face, at first it was just confused. You know what? And then the thing that everybody said was, congratulations. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird. Um, and then I'd see on their face that, uh-oh, what did I tell him yesterday? <laughs> uh, and some of the people uh, that, that knew me really well, um, when they were, were surprised that I was a pastor, I, some of them I asked, like uh, one of my teachers, uh, one of my coaches, and several of my friends, well, when we were in high school, did you ever think about what I might be? A bunch of them said, I was sure you were going to be a politician. So that's interesting. And maybe in some ways. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Now, um, in the New International Version, the, this uh, verse 2 and 3 are the same paragraph. I broke them apart because I, I see a contrast here. It goes on to say, uh, many who heard him were amazed. And this is the things they were thinking and saying, where did this man get these things? What, what is this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? That's what some of the people were thinking and saying to each other. But then in verse 3, it's a shift. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? You see, he grew up, carpenter's son, he grew up becoming a carpenter. And so by the time he was 30, he had been a carpenter for a long time. And so then he starts his ministry. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? The brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. It's kind of, who does he think he is? We knew him when he was a little brat running around here. You know, we were all little brats running around, weren't we? And then, let's go on. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. So Jesus just gave a little bit of prophecy right there. And, uh, and he, I, mean, I think he took it pretty calmly, didn't he? Verse 5, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. You see, it takes faith on our part for us to receive the miracles that Christ has for us, that our Heavenly Father has ready for us. It takes our willingness to trust in Him, to believe in Him, and to act upon that belief. I've heard many testimonies of people who were out to prove the Bible wrong and then finally, in frustration, after every time they thought they were going to find evidence to prove that the Bible was wrong, they were finding evidence that it was correct. Archaeological, I mean, the guy quit, one of them quit being head of the uh, hurricane weather watch in all of the southeast United States, retired from that early, and studied archaeology and the Bible in order to go prove that the Bible was wrong. And so multiple people have sold and uh, told me in classes or, or uh, seminars and things like that while we were in Israel um, that they went into the research to prove, several of them, the man wanted to prove to his wife so she quit trying to be all Christian. And finally in desperation, all right, God, if you're real, Reveal yourself to me. Show me. Waiting for something to happen, waiting for something to happen. Okay, the next morning, I'm going to find a new project. God didn't respond to me. 
and he started reading the Bible again to find the new project, and everything was different. Everything was different. And it changed his life. All right. But here, Jesus could not do the miracles, except there, here's an exception, and it's an interesting one to me. Laying his hands on a few sick people and healing them. So what that means is there were a few insignificant sick people that when Jesus went over with the love in his eyes, maybe a smile on his face, and, and just touched, and maybe, I don't know what he would have said, because they didn't tell us much. It was very low-key. So I imagine it was, be blessed. Or your Father loved in heaven loves you. Something soft, something quiet. And because of their faith, they were healed. But it was not obvious and apparent to everybody else that didn't want to, didn't want to know, Jesus didn't show them. And so that's how we have what seems like one thing is said and another. He could not do any miracles there. Well, he could have. He was ready to. Except by laying hands on a few sick people and, and healed them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith, the lack of faith in his hometown. Jesus went around teaching from village to village. And calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except, and he gives a list of some of the things, and they went out and preached. You see, he told them, go out. Can you imagine Jesus right now telling you, now go out and teach and pray for people and you have the authority over the, the evil spirits and you would be going, how do I know that I can do this? How can I be sure? And uh, they went out and preached that, oh, Jesus would say, just teach them the things I've been teaching you. Go out and say what you've been hearing me say. Do what you've been seeing me do. I've had so many times in my, since my beginning of ministry, where I knew God could, I knew Jesus could and would, but I had my doubts as to whether it was his plan to do that for me or through me. I had a question. I wasn't sure. But it's that faith of a, a little bit of faith, you know? And so I often pray prayers that I did because, well, I'm the pastor. I have to, even though I'm sure the next time I come to visit, this person's going to be dead. And so I pray prayers ask for beyond what the doctors said was possible and I would see that things happen. How will I know? I won't know until I give it a shot, really. Now I want to share a miracle and then I'll go ahead and finish. I have three of these I was planning to do. I've already, no, I have four, but I already did one that the guy in the uh, exploring of our manor um, it was a, an intriguing and uh, thrilling and fearful and exhilarating experience to drive on the proper side of the road. Um, a gentleman that I was visiting with at breakfast uh, asked where I was from, and, and I told him, I would say Florida, and everybody would say, oh, we've been praying for your for your state, for the people in Florida. We feel so bad for what's happening there. And, uh, but anyway, we, we struck up conversation and uh, he said, I, I, I mentioned about driving on, uh, the adventures of driving on the roads here. And he said, oh yes, when I went to America, it was very difficult to, to, uh, to drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> here in England, we, live, we drive on the proper side of the road. And he said, in fact, America is in the minority for most countries across the world drive on the proper side of the road. And I said, yes, here in England, y'all do drive on the proper side of the road. 
In America, though, we drive on the right side of the road. <laughs> and he looked at me and I said, so we're right and you're proper. <laughs> Um, but that conversation went a little beyond that into relational things. And, uh, and so again and again, little conversations like those, I was realizing that um, I could see God at work in this and that for the conversation to go in a certain direction. And I was really practicing not being the one to lead the conversation, but asking God to reveal the the direction for the conversations. And so uh, I have several other conversations with other people, but I want to talk about the miracle for Valerie and me. <laughs> miracle for Valerie and me, driving on the proper side of the road. It was a scary experience. It really was. Um, I got into the car a little bit fearful before we even started because it was an unfamiliar car, but the steering wheel was on the wrong side of the car. And I knew I had to drive on the left side of the road. Someone else shared with me from there that if you think about it, you're supposed to be on the center line. The driver's on the center line. Over here, the driver's on the, oh, it's the guy that drove in America. He said, the driver's on the center line in America. The driver's on the center line in, uh, in Great Britain, in most of the world. So that was helpful. Um, but those roads are very narrow. Mm -hmm. Now, Valerie was sitting on the left side of the car. The fact that the stick shift was at my left hand <laughs> was a difficulty to start with. And it was a six-speed. I was most used to a three-speed and had for a while had a four-speed that you could push an overdrive button on. Um, but this was a six-speed. So there was a lot that was unfamiliar and I was uneasy, and knowing that I always had to pull, if I'm going to the right, I have to go across and, on, and to the right in that lane. If I'm going left, I need to turn into this lane. And to look both ways before you even walk across the street, we were taught, look to your right, look to your left, and look to the right again before you start walking, and then look to the left again, okay? I was always looking in the wrong direction when I crossed the street. So there was that kind of thing. Now there's already the thing of husband and wife and uh, one person telling the other person how to drive when they weren't driving. And I word it that way because I do it to Valerie too. It's just different things. And um, I know that Valerie is amazed that I ever get anywhere when she's not in the car to tell me when to turn. <laughs> and, it's, and she's amazed that I don't uh, run through every single red light. And uh, sometimes I can just enjoy that she's reminding me every turn on things. And, and I should just enjoy that she does. But then my pride kind of starts to go, and I, I want her to know, I already knew that. I already knew that. You know? and, and Satan can use those things against us. God gave us a wonderful education in caring more about each other than we did about who was right on the driving. Um, I understand it was a very fearful thing for Valerie to not be in control when the on her side of the car, it's skinny, skinny lanes, even though we were a small car. On her side of the car, I kept putting the left wheels right on the edge of the curb. They have a little bit of a curb on their country roads. Um, kind of smooth, worn stone. Um, but I kept touching just on the edge of that to know where the left side was. And that put her about that far from those hedges. You know, tall, tall hedges, they're a thousand years old. Going right like that, right beside her. And then on the other side, she couldn't tell how much room I had. And I my mirror and the other people's mirror had about two to three inches as they went past each other. And they drive fast. They're comfortable with it. So, it was already a scary thing for her. 
But also, we were on one of these new stupid smart cars. Or stupid new. That's a, it's a stupid new smart car. That as soon as we got on and we're driving at night from the airport to our destination. And it was constantly going, ding, 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 ding. What's it dinging about? And I'm speculating on what it might be. There's not really any evidence. We don't know. But it was dinging all the time. It was dinging if I got too close to the computer, too close to the left side, or too close to the right side. Well, there's that much difference on when I'm too close to one side or the other. So that was dinging all the time. It was dinging all the, every time a car zoomed past me, because that car's too close, that car's too close. Watch out. It was dinging, dinging when I went too slow and when I went too fast. And so I had, a, I, I had about a five mile an hour difference. So it's all these different kinds of things that were stressing. But I think the roundabouts were the worst. Okay? In my experience of roundabouts, usually in a nice little neighborhood where they decide, you know, let's do something prettier than um, a uh, stop sign. And they make a little roundabout. Well, these were roundabouts that were sometimes smaller than what I was used to and sometimes um, two, well, four, four four-lane highways are coming together, or five. Or maybe there's two small roads coming in on the same one. And so the GPS would say, um, exit the roundabout on the third exit, or exit the roundabout on the third exit. And so I didn't know whether she was saying third or as, you know, do you know what I'm saying? Third or first. So sometimes I would say, Barry, which one did she say? And Barry would say, this one, this one. And she was right. But I just wanted her to say third or first, you know. Um, so there were a number of things that were, con that were obstacles for us to deal with. Uh, now I did have the GPS and it would give me on the map, but first it would show me, and they also had signs on the road a little bit before you got there, that would show you if there's three branches off, uh, plus the one you're on, or four, or five, um, but there were, they varied. We even had one roundabout after more than a week of driving, um, that instead of get to the roundabout and go left, clockwise, it was get on the roundabout and go right, and that was crisis moment. We're going to go backwards on a road that's already backwards, or you know, and and so we're going to go right and take that roundabout and then get on another roundabout and then go the other way. That was freaky. There were reasons for us to both be really tense, and there were a lot of opportunities for us to be yelling at each other. This one, this one, this one. No, 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 the next one. You know. And what I began to realize is sometimes I was wrong about which one, and sometimes Valerie was wrong about which one. But if I when I decided to just go to, <laughs> go whichever one, see, you see the tension? Go with whichever one Valerie wanted me to, to do. Um, if she was wrong, immediately she knew it was wrong, and she'd be upset in a different way. Um, so, what I began to realize is that God was helping me to helping me more and more so that I would less and less respond frantically back to her when she felt frantic. And God was helping me to re talk in a quieter thing. It'll be all right. And he was giving me insights that I wouldn't have had. And I won't go into examples but I've said before, I know that it's God speaking to me when it's just a few words. Two, three, or four words. Sometimes five. Because I don't have few words. And so God was, a, a few things that he did for me. One was for me to realize this is all for Valerie. And so I need to not, uh, she needs to be calm. I need to be calm for her. Another thing that he helped me to realize is that I should, uh, once we, uh, 
He helped me to realize that uh, once we were on a road where we were going to have 10 miles of no roundabouts, and I gave time for calming down, I said, honey, I've recognized that there's several times that I was wrong on which one to get off. And there were some times that you were wrong on which one to get off. And you, you feel even more upset when you were wrong. So I said, how about, as we're getting on the round, the one thing, I, I need your help when reading signs, I need your help on hearing what she says, but you let me decide which is the second one and which is the third one. And then it will always be me that's wrong. And we won't be yelling at each other. And she agreed, and that helped. One of the things God pointed out was that we, uh, if we miss the turn, we would just drive for a while, find another roundabout, go around it and come back, and we would have seen a part of England that we would not have seen otherwise. And then also, sometimes, the GPS would just say, oh, well then go this way instead. But bit by bit by bit, the most important thing is that the very first morning, after our first scary night of driving from the airport, I was pulling out of the, or, parking space and Valerie said touch me on the touch me on my leg and said Frank let's pray first and she came up with that the very first one let's pray before we go and I think she had me pray and, and I for us and every day we prayed sometimes more than once for God to uh, give us the courage and give us the peace and let us be calm and every day it got better. How will I know? How will I know if I'm doing what God wants me to do? I ask Him to help me. We ask Him to help us and we listen for an answer. We look for the answers and we follow through with the moving forward knowing that he is going to be the one who is with us. I will be with you. So when we have no clue of how to do it, but he's calling us to, remember he said multiple times, I will be with you. God be with you. Amen. Valerie, did you ever drive? <laughs> no, I have to the extra driver. <laughs> it was almost as scary figuring out the bus routes and the train routes, but we did, and that gave us travel that was less stressful.